Hello to everyone. We thank you for joining us on tonight for Bible study. Our scripture tonight will come from Colossians 2, verses 6 through 7. Colossians 2, verses 6 through 7. And it reads, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And from the devotional that I read this morning, it says, as Christians, we must do our best to make sure that our actions are accurate reflections of our beliefs. Our theology must be demonstrated not only by our words, but more importantly, by our actions. In short, not only by our words, but in our actions. In short, we should be practical believers, quick to act whenever we see an opportunity to serve God. And it goes on to say, we may, we may proclaim our beliefs to our heart's content, but our proclamations will mean absolutely nothing to others or to ourselves unless we accompany our words with deeds that match. The sermons that we live are far more compelling than the ones we preach. So remember this, whether you like it or not, your life is an accurate reflection of your creed. If this fact gives you cause of concern, don't bother talking about the changes that you intend to make. Just make them. And then, when your good deeds speak of themselves as they most certainly will, don't interrupt. Although God causes all things to work together for good for his children, he still holds us accountable for our behavior. Either God's word will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from God's word. So how do you guard your steps? By walking with Jesus every day of your life. And that is coming from Colossians 2, verses 6 through 7.
thank you now. We honor you, Father. We bless your name. God, we thank you, Father God, for another honor just to talk to you. God, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. Lord, we say hallowed to your name. God, we glorify you for you are worthy. For you are awesome. You are amazing. God, we thank you, Father, for just being who you are and for what you do. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that you have promised us all those who trust in the name of Jesus the Christ, all those who trust in the death burial of Christ, that you have promised us a building that's made by your hands, not by the hands of man. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for a life-transforming encounter with you. Lord, we thank you, Father, for just blessing us, Father God, to encounter life with you. Lord, we ask you to bless us now as we go through your word, as we go through the principles of your word. We ask you to speak to us tonight. Bless us, Father God, that we will be about your business and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. from the Almighty God. It's not because we've been so good, so kind, so particular. It's because God has blessed us. Tonight we'll be looking at two passages of Scripture. John chapter 14, verse number 6, and Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. John 14, 1 John 14, verse number 6, and Genesis 12, 1 through 5. God has tremendously blessed us one more again. We'll be covering uh, pages 10 through 14, 10 through 13 tonight, and we will close out uh, day one of unit one. Amen? Day one of, of unit one. The author goes back and he reviews some of the principles that he has blessed us with already. At the top of, top of page 10, he reiterates the goal of this study. The goal of the study is reiterated before us, and the goal of this study is to have a life-transforming encounter with God. A life-changing, a life-transforming encounter with God. We've already said several times, and Paul, the Apostle Paul writes that once a man comes in contact with God, he can never, he shall never be the same. Amen. When a man, woman, well, boy, girl comes in contact with God, their whole mannerism changes. Uh, their whole lifestyle changes. Their whole look at life, their whole world view changes. When a person comes in contact with God, they have a life transforming encounter with God, their lives are transformed. Their lives are made the better, not the worse. The Apostle Paul says that when a man gets to know Christ, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And we, we certainly have to understand that some of these things won't become new overnight, right? That's right. That's right? You won't stop doing all the things that you've been doing for a lifetime overnight, but your life will change. Matter of fact, the way you view life changes. That's right. right. Your worldview changes. How you think about God changes. Right. How you think about yourself changes. Because the fact of the matter is, once you get in contact with God, That's right. let me just share with you, self-esteem is built up. Right. Self-character is different. 
the way you view other people are different. It's simply because God has transforming power on our lives. The top of page 10, it says that the goal is to have a transformed encounter with God. It's not just to finish a Bible study class. It's not just to finish a book. It is to have life transformed. Made over, made differently. It is to be transformed. How do we do it? The author says we must have that experience with a person. That person is Jesus Christ. What I'm saying to you today that you cannot, you will not have an experience with God unless you have an experience with Jesus the Christ. No one has done it except they've done it through Jesus Christ. Uh, so, so you got to have this life transforming encounter with God. So you have to have this life transforming encounter with God. And without that encounter with God, you'll be saved. Matter of fact, you'll love being who you are. People are so proud of who they are. They're so proud of what they do. They're so proud of what they've accomplished. But at the end of the day, it has to be a life-transforming encounter. Amen. Encounter with God. Yes? Yes. The author goes on to tell us in the second paragraph, he tells us the way we can have this life-transforming encounter. Look what he says. We have to have a personal daily walk with God. You need a personal, I need a personal daily walk walk with God. It can't be hit and miss. It has to be personal. It has to be daily. It has to be an encounter with God. And it has to be ongoing. A personal encounter with the maker himself. Amen. We're on page number 10. We got to have a personal encounter with God him, himself. Yes? yes? No? Maybe so? Yes. Maybe so? Yes. So our relationship, our Christianity is a relationship with a person. That person is God. Our relationship must be with a person. That person is Jesus the Christ. And as we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we have a walk with God, let me tell you, it deepens our relationship with him. Yes, so David, will you come and read the story of the farmer for us, please? Thank you so much for volunteering. God is such an awesome God, isn't he? He's just such a good God. Yes, yes he is. <laughs> yes he is. Okay, so this is at the bottom of page number 10. Jesus is your master. <coughs> and it says, for 12 years I pastored a church in a city surrounded by farming communities. One day, a man invited me to visit him at his farm. His directions were something like this. Go a quarter mile past the edge of the city, and you will see a big red barn on your left. Go to the next road and turn left. Take that road for three-fourths of a mile. You will see a large poplar tree. Go right for about four miles, and then you will see a big rock. I wrote all of this down, and only by the grace of God did I eventually manage to find the farm. The next time I went to the man's house, he was with me in the vehicle. Because there was no more than one way, because there were more than one way to get to his house, he could have taken me any way he wanted to. You see, he was my map. What did I have to do? I simply had to listen to him and do what he said. Every time he said turn, I did what he said. He took me a way I had never been and could not have discovered on my own. I could never retrace that route by myself. The farmer was my mouth. He knew the way. Thank you. Thank you. So 
the, the farmer gives two different scenarios, right? At two different times, two different periods. He talks about being a pastor and finding his way around the neighborhood. What is different about the two different moments? What, what are they different? How are they different? The one, the one, the first time he was by himself. Okay, the driver. The driver was by himself. Okay. And he was, he was trying to find, he was trying to get to the location uh, just by reading some directions. Okay. But then the second go around, he had the individual inside the car with him <laughs> who knew the directions, right. but he then took him a different route. Um, and so if he had not had the, 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 the individual in the vehicle with him, he would have never found that other yeah. route to get to the destination. Okay. So he was told about the way to get there the first time. Right. And as he was told, he was writing it down. Mm -hmm. Had he missed one simple turn, mm -hmm. he would have ended out in Dilly Wadilly. Mm -hmm. Yes? He would have ended up somewhere else. somewhere else. But because because he followed the directions as they were given, he followed the directions to a T, guess what happened? He got to the place. And when he got to the place, he arrived on time, he arrived at the place he was headed to. This second scenario is the person who was giving him direction was driving in the car with him. He didn't have to pay attention to the paper, did he? Why didn't you have to pay attention to the paper? Because the person yeah. said, turn right. <laughs> Gave step-by-step directions. So he says, he said, he didn't say, uh, 200 yards, you will take a right to go to so-so street. Mm -hmm. And he didn't say, go see the oak tree down the road, and when you get to that oak tree, take a left. But he said, turn here, turn there, turn there, and it was a different direction. Mm -hmm. Now the author called this old farmer the way himself, the map himself, the GPS himself. How did this apply to us and how did this apply to Christ? Or does it? It does. How does it apply to us? How does it apply to Christ? How does it apply to our relationship with God? Because Jesus, we could say the farmer is Jesus, and Jesus knows the way. So the only thing we have to do is just follow Jesus and turn what Jesus say, turn, and you know we'll okay. reach our destination. So we, we just have to obey Jesus, follow the direction of Jesus. Who has John chapter fourteen verse six? John chapter fourteen verse six. John fourteen and six. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay, thank you. So Jesus didn't say that I'm going to show you the way. He says, I am the way. Jesus says, not only am I a person, I am the way. So when we talk about the way, we must talk about Jesus. He didn't say I was going to sign somebody to show you the way. He says, follow me because I'm the way. When we look at John chapter 4, Jesus is, is getting his disciples together. And as, as, as you go toward the end of that chapter, he's calling his disciples. And every last one of them, he says, follow me. Follow me. Why can Jesus say follow me? Because he's the way. And if you follow Jesus, you will get to the right place and you will get there at the right time and you will get there the moment you need to be there. This, and you won't get lost. The senior saints used to say it like this. He may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. So Jesus gets us where we need to be. He gets us there on time. Do you think Jesus is ever late? No. Nope. We look at John chapter 11. They thought Jesus was late. You look at John chapter 11, and you don't have to turn to it now, but when you look at John chapter 11, Jesus' friend, one of his best friends, is sick unto death. 
Lazarus then dies. Jesus tearing where he was, when by the time he gets there, Lazarus is already dead. And when we look at it, we say Jesus got there too late. Jesus got there late, but Jesus is never late. Why do you think I tell you when, when you when you get to church, if your cheek's not in the seat, that's a new term I learned. Did y'all learn that term? If your cheek's not in the seat, you're late. If you park pulling up on the parking lot, you're late. If you're not sitting in your seat with your paper out, your Bible out, your pen out, your attention focused, you're late. And some people appear in the room, but they're still late in their minds and their hearts because they got other stuff going on with them. When you look at this story, the farmer followed Jesus, or the farmer, the driver, the pastor followed the farmer's direction, and therefore we ought to follow Jesus' direction. And guess what? Jesus wants us to follow the directions to the T, to the I, to the dot. How do I know that? There was a man that told, was told not to touch the ark. Mm -hmm. He was said, he was told the ark is going to be transported, but as it's transported, don't touch the ark. Mm -hmm. And he had a good heart, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He had a good purpose, didn't he? Uzziah, I think his name is, he touched the ark as the ark was falling. He touched the ark. And this man was a good heart. This man that was protecting the very presence because the ark of God was the presence of God. This man who had good intentions died because he didn't follow God's instructions to the team. Because he did. He, he said, I'm going to do it this way because I, I see conditions have changed. Maybe God has not made exceptions for this condition. Maybe God has not thought about this one. So because God had thought about this art turning over, I'm going to prop it up. And he took his last breath. We got to follow Jesus. We have to follow God's instructions. Just like he gives. Can you tell? Yes, ma'am. I'll let you go ahead. Hmm? You can go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to ask a question. Probably the question you're going to ask. No, it's not a question. It's just something to think about that I think is hard for a lot of us. When it talks, after it talks about the farmer's story, the question four, when it talks about a lot of times we want to follow God, but we want the details. And that's mm -hmm. the hard part is he usually doesn't give step-by-step -step details like that. And so he mentions in the book that we need to, we, we need a map, but we need to follow him one day at a time. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard part for, at least for me, mm -hmm. it's hard because I'm very much a planner and I want to know <laughs> just like he said in here, you want to know what to do, how to do it, how should I do it who to involve and, and what's the outcome Right. and that's typical, that's, I mean and even he says that's typical for most people but that's really me mm -hmm. and so this is the hard part for me mm -hmm. okay. is to know what this, to take a step back and say okay I'm just take a day at a time right. and figure out what he wants me to do mm -hmm. and not try to figure out the whole map and the direction we're going Right. So when you when you follow your GPS, there's a center point. You can you can push the button and say, bring the map back into the center. How many of you have taken the map and strolled it to see what it ends gonna be? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes? I mean when we had the old folding map, we had to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Because we had several different places we can go in order to get there, seven different streets, seven different highways. We still have several ways to get there. But God says, take this road. Right. One good thing I do praise the GPS for is sometimes it will tell you there is a route you can go that will save you 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. If you want us to show you this route, say yes, mm -hmm. or punch the street or whatever. And most of the times with me, I know where I'm going. There are some people that use a GPS everywhere, even when they go to a place they know where they're going. That's right. 
And sometimes I scroll the map and I see what a checkered flag is. I said, I ain't doing that. I said, I'm not doing that. I'm not going that way. Many times, most of the times, I get there sooner than the GPS is trying to take me. Because I noticed the GPS will take me all the way around 610 to get to 45 when I can just go off um, uh, 610 on this side and don't have to go all the way around the ship channel. Right. But sometimes, the reason why the GPS says go around the ship channel, up and over the ship channel, is because had I just looked just a little bit longer and a little bit farther, I would have saw this, this blood red line saying there's a traffic jam and people just sitting still in the parking lot. Yeah. And because God doesn't tell me all the details, and because the GPS doesn't show everything, I miss it. And we are people, and, and I don't think this is the only person, I know not the only person in this room, we are people that we want to know when, where, how, how come, how many, how we're going to get there, who we're going to see on the way, do we speak to this person as we go? Anybody in this room? And if God doesn't show us the details, then we are all frustrated. Then we start talking to God about, God, are you still up there? God, do you see what I'm going through? My emotions are upside down, twisted. I got nerves in my stomach, and, and my intestines feel like they're about to ring out. And not to mention that, God, I've been going through this a long time. It's like having children, and you know if you go down this road, you're going to hurt yourself. And sometimes with your children, you have to bag back. Say, God is in your hands. And we are God's children. We will never be grown children. We are God's children. And God sometimes has to bag back to let us do it our way. And, you know, it seems cruel that God doesn't give us all the details. Even though we have the Bible. Let me tell you, one of the hardest things you can do is have faith in trouble. Yes? No? Maybe so? I mean, when you see things with your eyes and you know, God, I can fix this. But God says, wait. When you look at Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 4, at the end, at the end of that chapter, Jesus is in, in on the boat and there come winds and waves and trouble and storms. Jesus sleep. <laughs> the men on the boat in trouble. They have sense enough to wake him up and ask him, do you not care? Do you care if we perish? Jesus wakes up dead out of a sleep, stands on the top of the boat and said, peace be still. And the winds stopped howling. And the waves laid down like a baby. Let me tell you, that's the situation we all want to be in. We all want to be in a situation that when trouble hit, we can tell Jesus, Jesus, get up, don't you care? Jesus stands up and he says, peace be still, and all of our troubles are gone. That's the situation we always want to be in. Whenever we're in trouble, we want Jesus to shut it down. But I say to you, sometimes Jesus calms the storm. The other times Jesus calms his child in the midst of the storm. What did I just say? Sometimes Jesus will shut the stuff down on the outside of you. But other times Jesus will shut your storm down on the inside of you. And every now and then there's a storm on the inside of you. Interviewers like to ask people who are who are professionals and people who are successful. What is it that keeps you up all night? They like to ask that question. They won't go ahead and ask the person the further question is, how do you handle it? How do you fix it? We need to know how to fix it, right? But God didn't give us the details. We ask these questions. 
when, where, how, who, what way, what are the details? We want to know the details. And guess what? We don't want to know the details tomorrow. <laughs> when do y'all want to know the details? We want to know it right now. God, I don't want to move another father until you give me all the details. But if he gave us all the details, there would be no need for faith. Our faith is made or broken in times of trouble. Our faith is assured or discouraged in times of trouble. When I first started pastoring, <clears throat> preacher said, you're not the pastor until you had a showdown at the OK Corral. He said, some trouble got to hit you. Some trouble has to hit the church in order for you to know and realize that you're the pastor. And then he went on to say, in order for the people to accept you as the pastor. Well, with me personally, we didn't have to wait very long. I mean, when I came in the door. When I came in the door. When I showed up. Matter of fact, before I was voted in. And then when we get in trouble and we know God has placed us there and know God has put us in this situation and then a storm shows up then we want to say, maybe I heard God the wrong way or I didn't hear him at all. And a lot of people quit. A lot of people stop because God didn't give them the details. A lot of people shut it down. People give up because God didn't give them the details. And I got to that point in my ministry in less than six months. I said, okay, y'all been together for 30 years. Y'all do it y'all way. I'm going to take my wife and my daughter. We're going to go. But God said no. I mean, literally. 20 years later, 19 and a half years later, I was about to walk out the door. But what God did, didn't give me no details. But here I stand, 19 and a half almost 20 years later. And we agonize sometimes because God doesn't give us the details. And you know, another point, Pastor Davis, I think that we have to make sure that we're hearing God's voice mm -hmm. that's telling us which way to go. Your last week's lesson ended by us listening to God and make sure we hear God's voice. How do we hear God's voice? Number one, in the Word. Number two, in prayer. Number three, in Bible study. Number four, in meditation. We have to hear the voice of God. And if the voice of God we think we hear doesn't line up with what's in here, it's not God's voice. God never, ever, ever, ever contradicts what he says. And sometimes God speaks in the word and he's not talking to us. Keep the Sabbath and make it holy. We even got confusion of which day is the Sabbath. Then Jesus comes and he says, now remember this. The Sabbath was made for the man and not the man for the Sabbath. In other words, don't let the Sabbath control you. You control the Sabbath. We got animal lovers all around us. And they say you ought not kill snakes. And you know, right? <laughs> Jesus. They say you ought not kill wild animals. But the Bible says to Adam, he says, you subdue the earth. You make the decision. You handle all these animals. He says everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that fowl, that flies in the air, every last one of them, everything that swims in the sea, everything that walks and runs on the earth, Adam, you have control of I, I, I go to that verse. I think of it in my mind all the time. I got control, and if they get in my space or I wonder in their space, I need to maintain control. Yeah. 
I have to maintain control. So God, God doesn't give us everything, but what he wants us to do, we must establish a personal daily walk with him through prayer, meditation, and Bible study. My relationship with God is most important, it is the most important part of knowing God's will and doing God's will. My relationship, this is my intimate relationship with God. It is most important when I learn who God is. That's why the Hebrew writer says, he that comes to God must believe, first of all, he is. And then after you believe he is, he says, you must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I believe that we ought to lay it on God, but I also believe we got to keep knocking. Jesus tells this story about the woman that kept knocking, kept knocking, kept knocking, and after a while, the judge, the, the bitter judge, the unjust judge, said, man, let me give this, this, this woman what she want, because she's going to wear me down. And he parallels this to our prayer life. And when we pray, we want, God bless me right now. Deliver right now. And God is saying, follow me. Jesus is saying, follow me. Meditate on my word. Spend time. That's why I told y'all last week, be prepared when you come to Bible study so we can, we can share and, and iron sharpens iron with each other. Yes? Iron has to sharpen iron with each other. We got to show each other. So we have to interact with God. This intimacy, this intimacy, this intimate relationship we have with God, if we don't have it, guess what? We're going to miss it. We're going to miss what God would have us to do. We're going to miss what God is doing in our lives. We're going to miss it, y'all. And you don't want to miss God. You can miss breakfast, but don't miss God. <laughs> Believe me, you can miss it. You can miss breakfast, you can miss supper, but do not miss God. Amen. Page number 10 and 11. We got the story of the farmer. Let me tell you what Jesus didn't say. Jesus did not say, I will show you the way. Jesus did not say that I'll give you a map. Jesus did not say, I tell you I will tell you which direction to go. Jesus said, I am the way. Jesus says, I know the way. And Jesus said, I am the only way. Jesus said, I'm the way. And then the author comes to the conclusion that he is my way. He is my way. You see that? If, if, if Jesus is going to be real in your life, he's going to have to be your way. Anybody struggle with that? Jesus is the way. We know that we want the details. I think everybody in the room, everybody that's listening, know the details. But if you look for the details more than you look for God, if you look for the details more than you look to Jesus, you're going to miss God. Right. It is clear. You're going you're gonna to miss God. Don't miss God. No, don't miss God. If you miss God, it's more devastating than you missing a good paying job. <laughs> if you miss God, it's more devastating, more detrimental than you missing good job benefits. If you miss God, it is more tragic than you miss your doctor's appointment. Mm -hmm. Don't miss God. Don't miss God. Our prayer requests. The question is, how do you pray? The author talks about these, these choices, two different choices of prayer. In the first choice, he, he identifies the fact that we pray, Lord, do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, when do you want me to do it? It's right there in your book, right? Lord, 
How shall I go about doing it? Lord, who shall I involve along the way? Lord, what will our come be? Isn't that something? I want to know the details. But the author, Henry Blackaby, says it this way in the experience of God's book. Our prayer ought to be this. Lord, as you go with me, tell me what to do one step at a time. Lord, as you and I walk this, this intimacy together, this intimate walk together, Lord, tell me what to do one step at a time. Amen. He says our prayer life ought to say, if you do anything, Jesus, tell me or tell us one day at a time. We will always be in the sin of God if we walk with Jesus and, and allow him to tell us one day at a time. We will be in the center of God's will. Amen. And when we're in the center of God's will, and our lives will be made for that. I just want to be in the center of God's will. Amen. I mean, there was a time in my life I just wanted my way any way I wanted, and I wanted when I wanted, and I want God to do it now, God. Songwriter says, if the wind keeps on blowing, and if the storm does not cease, one thing I'm convinced of, my soul is anchored in the Lord. What he's saying is, the wind can blow on top, the storm can be raging, but my soul is anchored, and the idea is there's a ship that's on the raging sea, but because my soul is anchored in the Lord, I am sturdy. I'm solid. Let the wind blow. My soul is anchored in the Lord. I'm not bothered by it. Amen. It doesn't move me. I'm not, I'm not shaken by it. My soul is anchored in the Lord. That's not just some song that we shout off. That's reality. The reality of it is we have to be anchored in faith so strong in the Lord that we can do this thing. That's right. And we can do it without detail, details. As I follow Jesus one day at a time, I mean, he's driving this point home. As I follow Jesus one day at a time, Jesus will keep me in the center of God's will. Right. Pages 20, 12 and 13, pages 12 and 13, I begin by asking some questions. Are you really ready to follow God's will? Are you depending on God Showing you every detail as you travel in life. And this is my resolution. And this is what the author suggests. The resolution and the resolve is, I am willing to follow God the Father. I am willing to follow God the Son. I am willing to follow God the Holy Spirit by faith and not by sight. I mean, it seems crazy, doesn't it? Somebody you can't see. Some situation you're looking at and you see the dangers. You see the heartache. You feel the heartache. You see the storm. You feel the wind and the storms. But you are expected to follow somebody you can't see. <clears throat> that's, why, that's why those who are not saved say it's foolishness to, to follow this man called Jesus. It is, it is you are you are you are a fool if you follow somebody you can't see. Okay. You know that's why people make the statement that that Jesus was not real. Okay. He never really exists. But now all the smart people, the archaeologists that that find bodies and find find uh, evidence that people live, now they are saying there was a man named Jesus. He had brothers and sisters. He was born to a virgin called Mary. His earthly father was Joseph. And he actually lived right around inside of Galilee, Jerusalem, and Nazareth. 
in the archaeologists had concluded that he was a carpenter's son and he was a carpenter himself. And they nailed this carpenter to wood. I mean, archaeologists, they're smart. I mean, they, they, they're well learned. And now they've got scientific um, equipment that can verify all this stuff. And the same ones that had doubt are now finding out that Jesus was real. Isn't that something? Jesus is real. And I go a step farther. Not only was he real, he is real. Not only is he real, I see him in working form every single day of my life. The Holy Spirit is real. He doesn't hit me. He lives in me. Songwriter says he walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I am his own. Anybody else? Any other comments? What number are we on? <clears throat> we're pushing toward the review portion of this, this, this first day. So we're in unit one, day one. When we come back next week, we'll be in unit one, day two. So these are some final points that I found in day one. Number one, God is absolutely trustworthy. You can trust him. God is absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, God is trustworthy. You can trust God. Number two, Jesus is the way. Not only is he the way, he's the only way. Jesus is the way. Who's the way? Jesus, Jesus is the way. No doubt about it. Muhammad is not the way. Confucius is not the way. Aristotle is not the way. Jesus is the way. Confucius is not the way. Jesus is the way. Someone asked me, why do you always call those out? Because that's what men are saying. They are saying that these are the great gods of the day. And they have come to the conclusion that Jesus was just another prophet. He's not the way. But I thought about to tell you on my way to the rapture that Jesus is the way. Number three, I do not need any other map other than Jesus the Christ. I don't need any other map other than Jesus Christ. I don't need no other map. Boy, that's terrible news. I don't need any other map other than Jesus of Christ. Number four, I must follow God how? One day at a time. I gotta follow him one day at a time. I told you last week, the reason why Jesus says when we pray, we ask for daily bread. God give us daily bread. God gave instructions to the children of Israel. I'm gonna give you manna for the day. Don't store it up. Don't eat too much. Don't be greedy. I'm going to give you daily manner. And they act just like New Beginning Rivers. They stored it up. They ate too much. They carried some home. And it began to rot in their mouths. God wants to make impressions upon our lives daily. That's why Leviticus says that every morning God gives us new mercies. Just because he woke you up this morning, you can't count this morning's mercy as tomorrow's mercy because he's not guaranteed to wake you up in the morning. How many of y'all looking forward to the top? Anybody? Y'all not faithful to that job? It's a beautiful thing. Anybody looking forward to retirement? Anybody, anybody get a point where they want to say, look, you can take this job and shut it. I'm not working here anymore. 
Now don't do that at the wrong time. And whatever you do, act like a Christ in whom you lead. You know, some people come to the conclusion, I'm, I'm out of here, I'm leaving, and they go around and cut everybody out there with their head off. Oh, One guy thought he had hit the lottery. Mm -hmm. He thought he had hit the lottery. Mm -hmm. So he went down there and looked at his numbers. He found his numbers in the middle of the day. And before noon, he had cut everybody out that he had a problem. And when he got down there to the lottery office or whatever you call it, they said, you missed a couple of numbers. That's a five, what you thought it was a six. That's a four, you thought it was a seven. Matter of fact, you have $200 instead of $2 million. Now he goes back to work. Well, you know, I didn't, I didn't mean anything I said. God is not a gamble. We can trust him as we walk with him every day. Number five, I have to follow God even when he doesn't give me the details. Number six, Jesus has been the way. He didn't just start being the way. Jesus has always been the way. Jesus has been the way. Number seven, this is a small tweet. Number seven, Jesus is my way. A lot of athletes are coming out now, and they, you can tell that they're not giving the Oscar award type speech. Giving honor to Jesus, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then they start right that cussing. There are some athletes that are standing on the word of God and before they even start the interview and answer the question, you can tell deep down in their heart they have Jesus. It's real to them. It's, it's, it's available to them. And Jesus has made himself available to them for a long time. Go back and look at C.J. Strauss' uh, testimony. He got a reason for Jesus. Mm -hmm. He got a reason to stay with Jesus. He better leave Rose alone, but he got a reason to stay with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Why y'all looking at me like that? He better leave Amber Rose alone. <laughs> no, 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 even, not even friendship. Mm -hmm. He better stay with Jesus. Jesus, he declares that Jesus is my way. Mm -hmm. Number eight. Jesus will always be my way. Jesus will always be my way. It doesn't matter who gets in the car with me. It doesn't matter who rides with me. It doesn't matter what the media says. I'm going to depend on Jesus. There used to be a, a, a license plate out when, before they started making you put a license plate on the front of your car. There was a license plate out that says, Jesus is my co-pilot. Mm -hmm. Even at a young age, I knew that was for Jesus is not my co-pilot. I can't stand and sit next to Jesus. John says, I can't even fit the tie up his shoes. He's not my co-pilot. He is the pilot. Every time I get on a plane, I get on a plane, I'm looking for the pilot. How you doing? Good morning. When I get off, thank you, sir. Because if the pilot doesn't make it, I can't make it. A woman was complaining because she paid good money for a first class seat. And she noticed that the airplane attendant kept going to the cockpit, taking nuts up there, taking Twinkies up there, taking food up there. And this was before they even took off. She taking food and everything these two guys wanted. She was packing it in the cockpit. This woman got upset. She said, look, I paid good money for this seat. And you paying more attention to the pilot than you are to me. She said, baby, if the pilot doesn't make it, none of us make it. We want him comfortable. We, want, we don't want his mind wandering. We don't want him to miss any gears, any thrust, any downward motion. We want him to be whatever he wants. Give it to him. Everything but a drink. 
Yeah. Everything that he wants, let him have it. So we have to practice on being in the center of God's will. We got to experience what God is all about. And when we are in the center of God's will, sometimes our will has to take a back seat. Isn't that something? If we're in the center of God's will, this is the way we have to pray. Lord, Jesus says, Lord, not my will. Your will be done. You got to mature to that point when you can say that. I, I have to mature to that point. Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, not my will, but you. God, I submit to your will. I humble myself under your will. Lord, I know you have the best thing for me. I have, I know you have me in mind. And I know you're going to do what's best for me. Now, Lord, I want this. I want it by this date. How many of you give God a, a time limit? How many of you tell God when you want it? How many of you pray specifically for God to do something? When I pray for those of you who go into the hospital and it's, it's predestined that you're going to have surgery, my prayer is, Lord, touch the doctor. That's right. Touch the anesthesiologist. Amen. Touch the anesthesia. Right. Touch the nitrogen. Lord, bless the attendants. Lord, control the nurse. Lord, handle the wheels on the table. Lord, set the atmosphere for a blessing. Lord, heal like only you can heal. And Lord, whatever you do, amaze the doctors. Let them know that you are in control. And not only are you in control, Lord, they have no control. Blow the doctor's mind where they will come back and say, nobody did it but Jesus. I'm trying to tell the story how I believe in 1995 God healed my heart where there was no surgery. And the doctor told me there is no need for surgery right now and there never would be. I said, well, doctor, what did you contribute that to? He said, well, over a period of time it just healed itself. I said, doctor, a problem that's been there over 27 years, you telling me now it just healed itself in four months? He said, well, I'm telling you what I saw on May 17th, I don't see on September the 5th. So I'm counseling the surgery. I said, well, Doc, what are you contributing to? He said, oh, the period time just healed itself. I said, well, I'm glad you used the word heal because only God can heal. Man can only treat. Fast forward a few years later, um, I was pushed in, had the surgery, and the doctor came to my side after the surgery. She had said, this doctor was smart. I mean, she went to the top of her class. I mean, she knew the heart inside out. And so she said to me, you think God going to heal you? And I'm telling you, he ain't going to do it. Those are her exact words. And she said to me that if you, if you do not have this survey, you, I will no longer be your doctor. And I just remember walking down this long hallway, St. Luke's Hospital, and I said, Lord, Bless me to hear it come out of this woman's mouth that God has healed me. A few months later, I had the surgery. She came to my bedside. She said, I have something to tell you. She sat on the bottom of the bed, the foot of the bed, and she said, when we got in there, we didn't see anything. We saw where the problem used to be, but it's not there anymore. So I had to ask the question. Well, doctor, what have you contributed to? She said, well, God healed you. My prayer was, God, bless me to hear it come out of her mouth. She said, God healed you. Sometimes past insurance change, so you got to change doctors, right? Maybe 12 years later, I'm walking into St. Luke's Hospital, going to a, a hospital visit, and I said, hey, sir. Hey, Dr. Colbert, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing, Dr. Col Coulter? How you doing? I said, you remember me? She said, yeah, you're the one that God healed. 
We have to be specific. And when we pray specifically, we have to expect specifically God to answer. But at the end of the day, whatever way God chooses to, God knows what is best for us. Amen. And we'll cry out, won't he do it? Have you tried him? He did it for me. Because every day of our lives are miracles. We, we are walking, talking miracles that don't deserve a miracle. Amen. And I'm telling you, Brother Taylor, God has done it again. He woke us up again this morning. He done Every day he gives us new mercies. Every day. So your homework is to finish reading chapter and studying day one, unit one. You got to finish and there's a review at the end. If there are some exercises, do the exercises. And so we can uh, move to unit two. So you're going to finish out unit one. I mean day one, I'm sorry. Unit one, day one, and you're going to completely study unit one, day two. So you're going to finish out the review of unit one, day one, and you're going to read unit one, day two. Yes? yes. And we're going to participate. We're going to, one, one of the assignments is to get in a small group, and guess what? We get a small group. <laughs> Look what God does. Look at God knows what to do, doesn't he? Amen. God wants us to get in a small group. The author says get in a small group and discuss these matters. Any other questions or comments? At the end of each chapter, there are three questions. What are those three questions? It's in the peak letters at the end of the chapter. What are those three, three uh, things you need to fill out? What was the most meaningful statement or scripture you read? What was the most meaningful statement or scripture you read? The second one? Reword the statement or scripture into a prayer or response to God. Reword the statement or the scripture to a prayer or response to God. What is God talking about? He said, God, you said that as Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when you pray, you're going to pray the word of God. So you're going to write it in such a form where you tell God, God, you said that Jesus is the way. Bless me, Father God, to follow Jesus one day at a time. Mm -hmm. So I gave somebody that answer. What's the next one? What does God want you to do in response to today's study? What does God want you to do in response to today's study? What does God want me to do? We already know he wants us to walk with him one day at a time. As we walk with him, he, he changes us. And we want him to have a give us a life-transforming encounter with him. We want a life-transforming encounter with God. And that's what we all pray. We all pray, God, give us a life-transforming encounter. The name of the book is Experiencing God, right? So we want to experience God to such a way that we've experienced him never before. Amen. This is my third time going through this study. Every time I'm experiencing God in such a way that I have not experienced him never before. And some of you have witnessed Sister Henry sitting there on the third row looking at her Bible that she's had for the last 20 years. And she'll say, you know, the message you preached last 2014, you use some of those scriptures you because God speaks to us in a different way based on what we are in life. Mm -hmm. yes? yes? Just like your songs. Some people like one song. And when they hear that song, I mean, tears start flowing. Their hands go up and they begin to holler. Mm -hmm. And they know what's coming up next in the song. They know what stands up. They know what portion is coming up next. And they shout out the same thing over and over again. So when we read the word and we do studies like this over and over again, God meets us where we are and he speaks to us a different way based on where we are. That's why we don't hinder children from coming to Christ because God speaks to them on their level. We can't, we can't have God speak to them on our level, right? God speaks to them on their level and then they grow in Christ. We just have to tell them the story. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. 
Jesus rose, Jesus was seen, and this story will change your life. Amen. There may be somebody listening to us tonight, and they need to be born again. They need to be saved. They need to know Jesus in the departing of their sin. This is the moment to get to know him. You cannot experience God without Jesus. Jesus is the way, and he wants to be your way. You bow your head with me and invite Jesus into your life. If you never received Jesus as your Savior, just repeat this simple prayer after me and invite him in. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe that you're born again if you honestly trusted Jesus as your savior. We believe that you're going to heaven when you die. For those of us who are already saved, let's continue to ask God for an intimate relationship, an intimate fellowship, a, a life-transforming experience and encounter with him. And I'm telling you, he will do it every time. Amen. It is oftentimes time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering and sacrificial gifts. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving to Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can do so. I'm mailing it to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Please remember. If you want to give to our children, now is a good time to give. Now is a good time to give to our children on their mission and death. Now is a good time to give. This coming Sunday, we will have our 31st church anniversary. 31 years of serving the same God with a successful ministry. The same God, the same church, walking with the Lord for 31 years. We will, we will welcome that morning uh, Pastor Aaron, Pastor Lionel Aaron, and we will welcome that, that evening Pastor Murray G. Martin, and we will welcome their congregation at 3 p.m. and 10.30 a.m. We're celebrating 31 years of ministry here at the New Beginning Church. Amen? Are there any praise reports or prayer requests? Praise reports. A prayer request. Praise him. Is there anybody that needs to come off the prayer list? Please give us Sister Davis if you have people that need to come from the prayer list. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Let us stand to be this mess. Father God, we thank you now. We honor your name. We thank you for your mercy and grace. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we take serious this encounter with you. Bless our lives and bless us focus to focus. And bless us, Father God, that we will walk with you. Lord, we pray for our sick and our bereaved. We ask you to heal, touch, bless for, bless our confused and those that, that need you in a mighty way like never before. Bless those, Father God, that is waiting on your blessing. We know that you're the only one who can bless us. You're the only one who can keep us. We ask you to bless us as only you know how. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. 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 Please remember, 
Saturday night, this Saturday night at midnight, we start our prayer and fasting moment. We are praying and fasting, and as well, we are avoiding certain foods and drinks. Amen? No pork, no beef, no fried foods, no soda water, and no sweets. Thank you so much. We're praying and asking God to bless our church, bless our personal lives, and bless the church as a universe. Amen? Thank you, God bless you.